Okay, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to lift you up. We want to lift your name up, Father God. We stand amazed at your, you've opened a door that no one can close. I, I, I cannot believe that we are here in this place. I can't believe that we're here. It's just such a, uh, an amazing reality. Father God, I pray that you would guide us, that we'd be led by your spirit. I pray for this time now that we would study your word, that we would really understand uh, the two fundamental truths of who you are, that you are Lord, we are your servants, and you are our Father, and we are your sons and daughters. And I just pray that we would hold both of these truths uh, side by side, that we would submit to you in faith and obedience, and we would also love you as, a, as our Heavenly Father. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, let's just go ahead. I just want to ask to make sure everyone has muted their mic so that there's belong feedback. Tonight we're on to chapter number three, Knowing the Father, session number four. And so I'm very excited. Uh, we are really going into the heart of theology. Theology is the study, theology is the study of God. And so um, let's go back to the text. So tonight we're, we're going to be studying about uh, who the Father is, who is God. And so uh, chapter number, number three, there's a lot of different passages that really explore what it means for God to be our Father, what, what the truths are about, about God. I just want to focus on two tonight. So just moving along here, just as a quick brief reminder, the learning approach is threefold. We're applying, we're learning stuff in our head. Uh, we're learning knowledge from the lecture, the homework, and the group sessions. And that head knowledge is going to go into the heart. And so we want to apply that knowledge first in our own Christian life, okay, before we can serve others. And then lastly, we want to apply that knowledge in the life of the church. And so it's around us, it's in the context of the church. So this is the learning approach of IT. I will remind you every week so that we do not forget that, that it's more than just head, it's more than just heart, it's really serving other people with their hands. Next, the format of the course is lecture. We're doing that tonight. We have homework, we have group meetings to discuss, and then also mentor-mentee relationships in which we are um, uh, developing in spiritual growth and also spiritual ministry. So this is really the format of each course, okay? Again, moving from your head to your heart to action, okay? All right, objective for tonight. I have two objectives. There's four passages of scripture. We might not get to them all. I pray that we can. Um, perhaps we cannot. We'll see how the time goes. Uh, number one, to become familiar with the two primary ways that God has revealed himself to us as the Lord and as our Heavenly Father. So there's two, uh, God as Lord and God as Heavenly Father. And then the second objective that I, I want us to see is that to begin to understand the balance between sonship and servanthood, or lordship and fatherhood, okay? Um, emphasizing one or the other, uh, we can fall into bad practices. We can fall into bad behavior. Um, not understanding that God is both Lord and Father. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get into uh, the, the text. Let's turn our, in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burning. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him from the bush, saying, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. 
Then he said, do not come near. Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come up to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent you. This will be my name forever. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. The name of the Lord. Let's quickly go back to uh, our PowerPoint. And what I want to do right now is I just want to talk through some, uh, if you notice in the text, we're going to go back and study the text, but if you notice in the text, the, the name of the Lord that will be remembered forever is the Lord, correct? If you remember that from, from, from the passage. And so I just want to highlight several, several things about this, this uh, name Lord, okay? And then we're going to go and just draw some more application once I have uh, given you some of this information here. So the first thing we want to see is this name Lord occurs 6,728 times in the ESV. So the word Lord, I believe, I could be mistaken, but is the most common, most, uh, most common name or most common word used in, in scripture. And that's not really including like articles and, and prepositions like that, but as far as a name. Now, I, will, I do want to specify there are different words for the there are different words in Greek and Hebrew for Lord. So it's not this same name, although this same name is incredibly popular. If I did a search, it wouldn't be 6,000, but it would be close to it because most, especially in the Old Testament, the, the, the Lord, all capital, signifies something special, which you will see in a moment, okay? The next thing we want to see here is that in the context, the name Lord in Hebrew, literally means I am. And so this is where we get the word Yahweh. You hear that, Yahweh, okay? Uh, uh, taking away the vowels, it's Y-H-W-H, -H, okay? So this is the name of the Lord, okay? I am, literally I am, okay? Uh, in, in a master's level course, we would discuss how the relationship between, so Yahweh, 
um, is very similar to Yehovah, Jehovah. Um, Jehovah is a combination of, anyway, it's very complicated. I don't want to discuss that tonight. But I do want to say that Jehovah and Yahweh are really the same name. When you go back to the original Hebrew, it's the same name, okay? And there's reasons as to why Jehovah became, Jehovah became what it is today. And we can have a discussion. Maybe I'll create a handout for those who are interested. But the, but the focus that I want to emphasize tonight is that you have this, I, this name, I am, as a name. And that's a very profound, interesting name, Diva, I am. Who will send you? I am sends you, okay? The next thing we want to see, though, is that the, the, the Hebrew uh, scribes and also the people never used the word Yahweh. And actually, we're not, we don't really know the actual pronunciation of the Lord's name, Yahweh. And, and that's actually a good thing, because if we were to take that uh, uh, profanely or in vain, we would be breaking one of the the most important and sacred Ten Commandments. And so it's actually perhaps providential that we don't actually know the precise pronunciation. We say Yahweh because that's the closest approximation, but we don't actually know that original pronunciation. Um, what the Hebrew scribes would do is they took the valve pointings from the, the Hebrew word Adonai, Adonai, and they put the valve pointings across the word I am. And so when they would come to the word I am in the Old Testament scriptures, they would not say Yahweh because they were so afraid of profaning and breaking one of the, the, the Ten Commandments. What they would do is they would say Adonai, which is Lord, literally means Lord, okay? Um, and so the fact that we have to understand is that the name I am was substituted with another name, Lord, okay? So we can, there's debate and huge, you know, what does this fully mean? What does I am fully mean? To a Hebrew, it meant Lord. Hence the use of the word Lord as a substitute. Is everyone tracking what I'm saying there? Does, that, that's making sense. So the, the, the substitute word, so as not to profane God's most holy and name that he will be known for all generations is Adonai, which is literally Lord. Okay, and so in your Bible, in the NIV, the King James, the ESV, whenever you see all caps, all caps, uh, L-O-R-D, all caps like the top, God is Lord, and you have the all caps. Whenever you see that word Lord, you know that that's the actual proper name, Yahweh, behind that. Okay, that's a special designation in our Bibles. The next thing we want to see is that we will not turn there because we don't have time. But Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5 says, Hear, o, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And ye shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. Okay? So Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 is the most important statement in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And then the command is to love the Lord your God. Again, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Okay? And so John Frame, he's a, he's a, he's a, a conservative, very good biblical scholar. You know, we don't agree with everything. We, hear, we read or hear, but I think this statement he makes, I really agree with the statement. The central message of Scripture fundamentally is God is Lord. God is Lord. That is the most fundamental message that God has revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. The Lordship of God in creation in covenant, in salvation, in our existence, in our future. God is the Lord. Uh, man is not. <laughs> you know, uh, we are not our own entity. We are not our own independent uh, beings. Um, Psalm 24 says, 
The earth is the Lord's and its fullness thereof. It's the earth and all the people that dwell therein. So the earth is the Lord's, its fullness, the people and all those who dwell therein. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, we are not self-autonomous. We are creatures in submission to the Lord of the universe. And that's a, when people don't understand that, there's, there's a under, mis, like, misunderstanding of why does God do this? Why does God demand that? Because he's Lord, because <laughs> he's the king. Um, and so that's the most profound truth, looking at who God is. As we're studying theology, the study of God, this is such a profound truth. This is such a profound truth for us. Now, the last thing we want to see is the, the name Yahweh or Lord denotes three fundamental concepts, three fundamental concepts that we want to unpack. Uh, we can also, I've talked about this before in Ephesians 4, for those who are involved in that, in that study, we talked about the sovereignty of God, again, God's lordship. The, we're just speaking to the fact that God is king. But with a king, there has to be at least three things. In order for a king to be a king, he has to have authority. He has to have, he has to have the right uh, to command or to control or to be in, 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 um, over in a lordship. So he has to have authority. Um, but if he has authority, but he has no way to enforce the authority, um, that's meaningless. So, so this idea of, of Lord not only connotes, uh, denotes authority, but also control or power. God has the authority, and he has the power, okay? Now, there's debate. Uh, does his authority come from his power, or does his power come from his authority? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. He's all-powerful, and he is the one in authority, okay? And then the third thing is, is that God can be all-powerful. He can have all the authority, but if he is not present, Cy Young. The, 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 the master, the mayor, the king, the president has to be present. He has to know what's happening in order to exercise his authority, in order to exercise his control. And so there's really three things that this lordship denotes in who God is. Control, authority, and presence. Okay? And this is going to be so foundational as new believers or as we're teaching new believers about who God is. Okay, any questions? I want to take a minute here. I want to ask questions. I don't want to rush. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, great. Okay, so now I've made some bold statements here. I've made some bold uh, uh, observations. What we want to do now is we want to look at at least one passage, perhaps two if we have time, that really supports this reality, that really supports this truth. Okay, so let's go back now to. Exodus chapter 3, and what we're going to do is we're just going to look, we're just going to look at <coughs> this passage. We're, we're not going to read it again. We're just going to look and see, do we see the lordship of God? Do we see his power? Do we see his authority? Do we see his presence? Okay, so we're just going to briefly look through here to see um, uh, and identify some things about God. Now, there, will, there are going to be some other things that I'm going to include. So there'll be a couple other things in addition because it, there is more things being taught in Exodus chapter 3 than, than those, those four ideas, lordship and then control, authority, and presence. So we just want to highlight those, understanding who God is, okay? So looking at Exodus chapter 3, um, the first thing I want to identify is that um, – you have here this idea that the angel of the Lord appears to him in the dream, uh, appears to him in the flame, correct? Oftentimes, uh, this angel of the Lord appears to be God himself. Okay, so... There is huge debate about who the angel of the Lord is. Um, you know, we, can, we could debate that. What I want to emphasize is that when you see the angel of the Lord and then 
And then the conversation turns to the Lord said, Moses said, the Lord said. The angel is inconsequential. God, God is literally speaking through the angel as if God is present there himself. Okay, so um, I, I, you should not be distracted by the fact that there's an angel there because later in the text, it's just God speaking to Moses. So um, I do want to draw your attention to, to that. You'll, you'll see that later on in the context. And also throughout the rest of scripture, you'll see this angel of the Lord literally speaking as if it's God speaking directly to Moses, okay? Um, the next thing we want to see here is that um, the, the, the bush is burning. So we have this idea of the, the, the bush is burning here, yet it was not consumed. The bush was burning, but it was not consumed. Now, I want you to think about the, the, the theological significance, okay? In order for there to be a fire, diba, there has to be something to maintain the fire. Diba. Fire does not burn from nothing. Diba. It, you have to have kindling or gasoline. You have to have some type of source by which the fire can be sustained. Diba. Uh, there is... There is no source for the fire. The bush was burning, but was not being consumed. Meaning to say, the bush was not supplying the fire with kindling. Okay? And this, this is a, 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 a physical picture of the self-sufficiency of God. God is existing. The fire is existing apart from the bush. <laughs> and this is this disturbs Moses. He says he he says I I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush was not burned. This is teaching us something. Um so at this point, let's just think about this for a second because we're going to have an answer. The answer is going to be in the context and it's going to be profound for us. Okay, so let's, at this moment, let's just at least recognize that the, 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 what's being, Moses is aware that this is very strange, that there's no source for fire, the fire is burning, but there's no source. It's not, it's not using the bush. Um, and this does seem to, to indicate the self-sufficiency of God, but we're going to confirm that, okay? Verse number, verse number four, um, God calls out to Moses, and Moses says, here I am. And then he says, uh, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground, okay? Um, what we have here are, Um, these are commands, Diba. Right? Command one, command two. Uh, um, there, there, there is this, this uh, implied is this authority, Diba. Right? He's commanding Moses what to do, and Moses is submitting to him. Now, now, this could be like, oh, of course, of course. Um, but oftentimes in our own lives, we do not think of God uh, in searching the will of God. We are often telling God what the will should be as opposed to waiting to hear what he says. Um, and so this is just a small point that really uh, God is the one in authority, not us. And we need to be submitting to his will. The, the other thing that we see here is this idea of, of, of holy ground. Uh, holy means to be set apart. And we, we've, we've talked about this before. God is, this is creation, and this is God. 
God is, God is holy, utterly holy from creation. There is a massive boundary here between God and creation. Okay? And so when you see holy, think set apart, completely other, uh, not part of creation. And then we have here in verse 6, we have in verse 6, we have this uh, declaration, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, it doesn't say this explicitly, but if you're Moses, what is, what is being indicated? You have this uh, uh, God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What do you think is being signified? What's the big, what's the really big uh, truth that all three of these have in common? Of course, God is their God. But what, what, is, what is the specific thing that God has done or said um, that is related here? What is going on here? Um, from your study in Genesis, I, I want to ask the question for, for anyone. Someone want to answer? Or God of the ancestors. Uh, Pastor Noli, can you repeat yourself? It's a God of the ancestors. Yes, yes. Okay, so, so there's this idea of, of, of um, uh, ancestors, or this would be uh, ancestors. of Israel, correct? So, that, so that is, that's one truth. And so connected with this truth, what is the, the, the ginormous idea, the ginormous statement that God has made to these men that's significant? Big. It's uh, God's promised love to his people. So uh, the promise to his people, that, that is, that, that's, that's, uh, uh, I like this word promise. What's, what, what is the, what is the specific promise? In what context? In what in what type of agreement is this promise made? From Genesis. It was made with Abraham, confirmed with Isaac, and then again established with Jacob. What's the, what's the, what's the big concept? This promise that in, through the seed of Abraham, there will be blessings. Yes. Uh, Abrahamic covenant which includes the covenant is the big idea so in the covenant there's agreement god makes a promise to abraham there's a requirement so abraham has to have circumcision uh, uh, he has to follow and trust god will be his god we will, uh, abraham will be the people the, the, the people of god there will be blessing there'll be a great nation there'll be so much seed diba so what's going on here is the Abrahamic covenant. Um, but but what, what God is saying, it, Moses knows all this. What he's bringing, what he's drawing attention, what God is drawing attention to is he is the, he is the God. It's the same yesterday and forever. Yes. The faithful God to yeah. his covenant. It's the same yesterday and forever. Yeah. Yeah. The exactly. same yesterday and forever. Exactly, Pastor Noli. And hence why he's visiting his people in the affliction. Because he's made promises and he's, he's going to make right. He's going to fulfill his promises, okay? So again, what, I, what, what, I'm, what we're doing right now is we're just drawing significance from this context. Um, uh, of who God is, who, what, what, what is this God, okay? Um, so, so some things are directly related to control, authority, and presence, and some things will, be, will, be, will become clear later. The Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. So there you have this idea of what, what, um, what Kuya, Kuya Henry was saying, my people. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them, okay? So from our study in
from our study in uh, uh, Romans chapter one, first week, Romans chapter one. What is the what is another word for deliver? What is another word for deliver? Romans chapter one. Salvation. Salvation. Ah. So when you see this word deliver, rescue, redeem, it's all salvation. It, it, those are parallel synonymous terms. Okay. So so and and salvation is in the context of the covenant, Biba. And so he's, he's, he's come down to save his people, right? He's come down to save his people. This also, this also denotes power, Biba. That's, that's going to be a, to save people from something, especially from the greatest nation in the, in the world. Egypt was, Egypt was like the United States of America is today. That's a big task. Rescuing people from the U.S., you know, they have all this, these movies where they're going in, they're getting them out of the jail, they're going in, you know, enemy of the state, blah, blah, blah. To, to, for, for Yahweh, for the Lord to say, I'm going to deliver my people is not a small task. That is a phenomenal task. And it's signifying his power. And really, there's also authority here. Um, he has the authority to take his people from Pharaoh. He has every right. He has every right to take the people. No doubt Pharaoh is like, they're my people. They're my slaves. <laughs> but, but God is the possessor of all. So even here, what I'm trying to help us to see is that in this context, although the words power and authority and presence are not explicitly men mentioned, the, the concept is saturated. The context is saturated with the concepts. Okay, let's go on here. Uh, verse number nine. And now behold, the people, cr the, the cry of the people has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Is this not presence? Is this not presence? God can be authoritative. He can be power. If he is not present to hear the prayers, the cries of his people, Zion, I have heard the cry of the people of Israel. Here we go. I will send you authority, Diva. <laughs> this, is, this is also similar to um, uh, we're going to see later tonight, sending his son, right? God sends Moses to, be, to go to Pharaoh, and then God also sends for us. He sends Jesus to save us. Moses is sent to save the people. Jesus is sent to save us. But, but again, the sending, the sending is this idea of authority. Um, and Moses, of course, in sending you, the idea here is this idea of, of, of servant. Diba. Moses is called the servant of the Lord. Even Jesus is referred to at, at times as the servant of the Lord as well, especially in Isaiah. Diba. So when this, the idea of sending is this idea of lordship, servant. So think about this. Lordship and, 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 and servant. So very application, very applicable. Someone who you're sharing the gospel with, you're sharing the gospel, they want the free gift of salvation. But then you ask them, do you want to repent of your sins and to, and to submit to God's law? Well, no, I still love, I still love my, you know, I still want to do that then they don't really want the free gift. They don't want to submit to the lordship of, of God or of Jesus Christ. Um, I, remember, I remember sharing the gospel at my gym in the U.S., and there was a, a weightlifter. He was, you know, he's using the juice, right? So he's very strong. So I have to be careful. Maybe he'll get mad at me. So, you know, he's giving, we're, we're doing bench, and we're always talking. And I, I shared the gospel with him. 
And, and, and I would reason with him. We'd see maybe three or four times a week. And you know what he said to me? He said, Tim, I know what you're saying is the truth. And I really want to accept it. But I have a question for you. And I said, what? And he had told me he had several abortions. He said, I've, I've had several abortions with women because I, he's, he said this, I love to have sex. He said, I love to have sex. And he, he said, I've had abortions though with my, my, my girlfriends. I said, the Lord can forgive. The Lord will forgive that. But you have to repent of your sins and put your complete faith and trust in Jesus. And he said, so that means I have to give up sex. And I said, outside the context of marriage, yes. And he said, I love sex too much. He said that. I love sex too much. At least he was honest. At least he was honest. So someone, uh, it's work salvation if they have to, to be earning their merit by not having sex. But if someone is unwilling to submit to the Lord, unwilling to submit to the Lord and his law, they're not repentant. They're not willing to put, put their belief and trust. They're still in love with their sin more than they are with Jesus. The question is, are you willing to, to choose to love Jesus more than your sin? More than your sin. And so, Again, coming back to this idea of, of, of lordship and servanthood, okay? Again, we're not saying that you, uh, many times there's deep sins. And so it's not that you're saved after you deal with all the sins. It's that, no, I commit. I'm, I'm giving up my sinful lifestyle and I'm choosing you, Jesus, whatever it means. And then there's the process of working through that sanctification, okay? But there has to be that commitment of turning. I'm turning away from my sin and to, and to Jesus, okay? And so fundamentally, God is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Um, and so if you're not willing to acknowledge the fundamental truth of who God is, you're not willing to accept his salvation. A any thoughts or questions? I don't want to rush too far. Any, any thoughts or questions or comments? Or, or if you want to share a, a story or... Okay, let's continue on here. So then, so then Moses argues with God, who am I, <laughs> right? Moses doesn't have any authority. Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh has a, an authority and bring the children out of, out of Egypt. Look at what, look at, so, so look at what God says. He said, I will be with you. I will be with you. Divine presence. Divine presence. Moses is going to Pharaoh. He's going by God's authority, not by himself. He has no power. Diba? But in authority, going on behalf of God, God always promises, always promises to be with us. Joe's, uh, Joshua's commission, I will be with you. Uh, 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 I, I think it's Samuel too. Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Jesus' great commission, I will be with you. Go into all the world, right? And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so there's always this promise uh, of, of being of divine presence. God as Lord is present in all of creation with us. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, verse 12, you shall serve God. Servant, serve, uh, I team. We're equipping so, so we can do the work of the ministry. Ministry is service, okay? So uh, servant implies lordship of God. So even when we talk about serving God, we're implying the lordship, it's inferred. And do, do we understand what's, what's being said when we say, 
I'm serving God. Wait, you're, serving God. You're, you're his servant. He's your Lord. Um, verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. That is literally the name of God. Now, what does that imply? Th think about what we've been talking about. Um, God says, I will be with you. This, this, this am, the, the verb here is am. Fundamentally, what does that imply? I am. What does that imply? Does this not imply existence? And it's not a past existence. It's not a future existence. I am who I am. Uh, connecting this, there's no one that can exist apart from anything else. I exist because of food. I exist because of sleep. I exist because of water. I exist because of a lot of different things. Uh, combining this at its core with the burning bush. Complete self-sufficiency. God is the only being in the universe that is completely self-existent without any need for anything. Of course, that implies someone that is completely self-sufficient. There's no other being in the universe. If you are completely self-sufficient, you have to be incredibly powerful. Diva. <laughs> For you to exist by yourself. If you are incredibly powerful, <laughs> you must have some type of incredible authority. For a being to be self-sufficient uh, and powerful, you must have an authority. Now, again, there's debate. Does the power come from the authority? Does authority come from power? Both are just true. I just want to say both are true. Um, and then thirdly, what this implies, I am, it implies presence. This implies presence as well. Now watch this, okay? So watch this. The way the Hebrews would say this, so as not to offend, they would say Adonai. Adonai or Lord. <laughs> so do you see what, what's happening here? I am designates complete self-sufficiency, self-existence apart from everything else. Creation, one hand. God, two totally different. But self-sufficiency infers power, authority, presence. Um, and regardless of all of that, the way the, word, the way the Hebrews, the substitute that the Hebrews would use so as not to break the commandment of God to take the Lord's name in vain, to use it vainly. They chose the word Adonai, Lord. Lord. So what I want us to see here, verse 15, God repeats himself. So he first says, I am who I am, okay? Then verse 15, God said to Moses, you shall say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent you. This is my name forever and thus will be remembered throughout all generations. The Lord has connotations in covenant, 
be bothered because Lord servant, right? Abraham's called a friend of God. He's the servant. He, you know, there's a lot of different connotations. So you have this, this, uh, the Lordship, and then you have the reference to You have this reference to the covenant with the forefathers, okay? Um, Thus it will be for all generations. Thus it will be for all generations. Okay, uh, there's so much more. We, we could study this for so much more. I just want to draw your attention. What I really hope that you can see here in this passage is, um, uh, let's, just, let's just summarize. Let's, let's go back to our PowerPoint and let's just... Let's just summarize some things, okay? Um, okay, I've already popped this out here. Okay, so, so let's go on to the next, to the next slide now. So, so what, what can we learn from Exodus three one to sixteen? Number one, what are some things that we can learn? God is self sufficient. God is completely self sufficient. He exists. Uh, he exists apart from our praise. He exists apart from our relationship. He does not need us, okay? God does not need, self-sufficient means he does not need. Now, of course, God wants our relationship. God created us to be in relationship, but he does not need us. There's a big difference between God choosing to enter into relationship and God having to need us. Um, God does not need you to do the work of the ministry. God does not need he will accomplish his task with or without us, okay? That's not to say that we're not called. That's not to say that we don't have a purpose. I want to emphasize, though, that people at times think of themselves as if I am so important, God needs me. And none of us should ever have that perspective. We should be honored and humbled, and we say, God doesn't need us. Uh, um, I am yours, so the first thing I want to emphasize is that God is completely self-sufficient. Uh, the next thing is that God is holy. God is completely holy from creation. He is, he is perfect. He's set apart. There's no part of God that is created. Okay? God has control, power, and authority. God has ultimate Control, power, authority. We see that in verses 7 to 10. So I'm just summarizing what we, what we discussed. Um, God is present, divine presence. God is present in our lives. He sees our needs. This is who God is. God is our Lord. And so these different ways are characteristics of this idea of the Lordship of God. Okay? So just to, I'm coming back to, to summarize again. God is the self-existent, self-sufficient God, all-powerful, the one with authority, and the one who is eternally present. God's sovereignty in his own being. Okay? So we talk about God, the, the fundamentals of Christianity. We as Christians, we as Christ followers, we as uh, believers, the number one truth about God is that he is Lord. The Lord our God, he is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And this is even more significant when we get to Jesus, right? If you confess Jesus is Lord <laughs> and believe in your heart, that he has been raised from the dead, you shall be saved. And so this lordship is a fundamental component. It's not all that's to be said. There's, there's so much more truths, but fundamentally, we must accept and submit to the truth that God is Lord. Now, uh, we do not have time. I had another passage of scripture, but we do not have time to go to that passage on lordship. Uh, Exodus 15. So what, so what you can do if you want to go deeper of course, we have your assignment in chapter three, so I'm not assigning an assignment, but if you wanted to really explore this more, 
Uh, go to Exodus 15, the Song of Moses. I preached on that a year ago at uh, one of the pastor's retreats. Um, Exodus 15, Song of Moses. And look at God as powerful, authority, and also present. It's all over there. It is all over the Song of Moses. Um, and the reason why I chose the Song of Moses, Mungo Kapitid, is because here, this is the commissioning before Moses goes. And then the Song of Moses is looking back. It's looking back at what God has done. So, so the, this is the commissioning of Moses and revealing of who God is. And then the Exodus reveals God's authority, his power, his presence as Lord. The Exodus should teach us God is the Lord of the universe. <laughs> Uh, and of course, that that includes deliverer, the power to deliver. And so Exodus 15, I think you will just be blown away by uh, his control, his presence, and his authority, even to command the wind, the wind, the waves to destroy. He just commands the the authority to command the waves to destroy the the the, the horses and Pharaoh's army. I, I just can't. So maybe we can talk about that next week. We'll talk about that next week if someone studies that. Uh, but anyway, um, any comments or thoughts? We, we'll go to one more passage and then we'll be done. A any comments or thoughts that you want to add to this? Dean, go ahead. about immanence. Immanence. Yeah. So we did not discuss eminence, but that's meaning to say that God, transcendence is that God is beyond everything. Imminence means, though, that he is present. So, so transcendence is he's above, he's far, he's above all things. But then eminence is that he's, he's close. And so there's eminence also conveys, conveys an idea of, of presence as well. Was that in, the, in chapter 3, Kapathid? Is that where you're, you're, you're seeing that word? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's, that really goes along with presence, that that's a big way of talking about God, God being close to us. And I think that's in the context of Father. That's in the context of Father, God as Father. Yeah. And we're going to see, we're going to go on now to God as the Father. And we're going to see these same things in God as Father. Okay. We're going to see these same things as God. In God. Uh, so I don't want to pit the two against each other. But I do want to emphasize both truths. Because there is slightly different truths that are being that are being conveyed in in these ideas so great question and observation pastor henry excellent anyone else want to add okay we are going to go to our last passage of scripture so what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to uh you'll see me sk skip through the slide oh i i forgot the last one god is faithful to his covenant so uh yeah that's <laughs> we talked about that so my apologies for not including that um but anyway, so let's go on. So uh, I'll just quickly go through here. Um, uh, but this is for you to study on your own time. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Yeah, we're going back. We discussed Romans chapter 8. We could study Romans chapter 8 for a month. I'm telling you that, or two months. So let's go back to Romans chapter 8. And we're, we're last week, Diba, we were looking at assurances of salvation, Romans chapter 8. Now what we want to look at, th this is related. So, so the idea of God as Father, the idea of God as Father is connected, uh, is connected with um, uh, assurance, okay? Is connected with assurance. So we're not going to read the passage again because <laughs> it's so long. Uh, um, let's just work through the passage and I'll just highlight some things so that we can see what we want to emphasize is God as our Father. And what does that signify? I just want to draw our attention to union with, union with this. Uh, so let's look at Romans 8.1. We're going back to union with Christ. Yeah. And what, what does this have to say? What does this have to say? concerning God as Father. So we talked about this being union with 
Christ. And there's so many different truths to union with Christ. What we want to identify here is um, uh, looking at God as Father. Um, the first thing we also want to see, so we're looking at God, God as Father, and we're also looking at those truths of control, authority, and presence, okay? Because that is fundamental to who God is. So even if God is now, we're looking at this idea of him being his Father, it's not that those other things are, are we're going to cast those aside. So we're going to add those and looking at how it's a slightly different picture of who God is, but there's a lot of analogous. So union with Christ, Viva, this is divine presence. Viva, divine presence, union with Christ, because Christ is Lord, Viva. So we have this divine presence. We are in union with the Lord, Diva. <laughs> and this works both ways. Christ is present with us. And also, uh, okay, I have to go here. We're going to go here. Let's just, um, this, is a, this is a side trail. Let, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So, uh, Christ is with us in, this, in his spirit, with us. We're in union with Christ. So, Christ is with us, okay? but we are also with him in the heavenly places, okay? So there's two components. Look, look, look at this, verse 5, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were made alive together with Christ, union with Christ, okay? By his grace you have been saved and has raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ now, okay? so. Union with Christ works both ways. It cuts both ways. Because we're in union with Christ, he is now with us, right? I will be with you until the end of the age. And whether it's him or his spirit, it, it's the same, okay? Um, so Christ is with us, and we are with him before the Father. <laughs> so think about that. Um, divine presence. We are, in a real sense, in in, um, in heaven with God now, not that we're literally there or our spirit's there, but that uh, the fact that we're, we're represented there, <laughs> if that makes sense, we're represented there, um, and, and Christ is representing us at the Father's side, and he is in the very presence of God. He is in the very presence of God. So coming back to here, Christ on our behalf is in the presence of God, and of course God is here too, but I want us to see that that this union with Christ designates this divine presence. Um, and this also conveys to us uh, who God is as our Father. Um, and so here, uh, uh, for verse 3, for God, or verse 2, for the law of the Spirit has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened in flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of, of sinful flesh and sin. And so here we see this of sending his own son. This is speaking to the love of God as father. Do you see that? And we know, we know it's father. We know that he is uh, revealing himself to us as our father because the context is his own son. <laughs> so Jesus is the son of God, and we are also brothers. We're going to see later. We're brothers and sons of God. <laughs> so, so already now in Romans 8, 1, God is the judge. He declares us no longer condemned. And now he is also revealing himself to us as father. Okay. And we're seeing the type of love that the Father has, sending his own son to save us. Okay, let's go on here. Let's go on to verse uh, Romans uh, chapter 12, 8 verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we live according to the Spirit, uh, if we put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, we will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. So what is, what is implied here is sonship. Oh, 
Okay, so do you, do you see this here? What's being implied here is sonship. Okay, so God as our father. And we are being led by what? We are being led by the spirit of God. So again, um, uh, we could say here, <laughs> uh, this of course is present, Stiba. But also authority, Stiba, authority. Because we are being led. We are not leading the spirit. The spirit is leading us. So this idea of leading, this, this, is, this is denoting, in a sense, lordship. We are follow. We are following. So what's being conveyed here is spirit leading uh, we are following. Okay? Watch this. For we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Okay? Now, so watch this. There, there, this is a double truth we have to balance. In one sense, we have to have a fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Okay, so there is a sense we should have a respect. We should have a fear of God. But it's not the fear of a tyrant. It's not the fear of, a, of, a, of an abusive relationship. Uh, we are not slaves to God in a negative sense. Okay, so that's why I've talked about balancing lordship and fatherhood. Okay, so we, we did not receive... We did not receive the spirit of slavery. We have not received a, a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption as sons. So this is, this is sonship. And this word for Abba Father is an intimate close relationship. And this really emphasized presence and care. This is a profound passage. We cry, Abba, Father. It's this idea, people, I never can get used to this, but the, the analogy in the U.S. is we cry out, Daddy. That's what they'll say. We cry out, Daddy. I can never, I just, that doesn't sit well with me. But it's that sense that it's this very intimate, loving, and gentle. The God of the universe is this gentle, loving Father. Imagine that. That's so profound. The creator of all things is also now our, our Daddy in a real sense. In, in very real, in, 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 as real as it can be. Salvation came in salvation. The three Godhead are there. Yeah. The three Godhead are there in salvation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. We see it here. The, 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 the Trinity. The, the Trinity are here. Tama. Tama. Um, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Again, this, this sonship. Fatherhood. We are daughters and sons of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified. We're going to see the significance of what it means to be heirs of God. Okay? As, as children of God. What does this mean? Okay? And then as we come down here, again, we have this, we're, 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 we're just highlighting this. Sons of God. Whenever you see sons of God, you have to think um, God as our Father. So this, I do want to come back and talk to us about this. When we pray, oftentimes I hear, you know, hear, it's very common, about on. we address God as on. And there are times in prayers where we address God as on. Uh, um, Acts 4, he's addressed as the sovereign Lord. So I'm not criticizing addressing God as Pangino On. 
That is the truth. We, we just discussed lordship, okay? But what I want to emphasize is that he is our father, and so we should address him as Ama. Diba Ama? Ama? Um, and you can address him as Tatai too. Talaga. I, maybe that's. <laughs> but Tatai, just like in the US, some are saying daddy. In the sense, not in a disrespectful sense, but he, he is our, our heavenly father. M moving along here, uh, the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of, of corruption and, and obtain the glory of the children of God. Again, this fatherhood, this fatherhood that's being implied. And not only in the creation, we ourselves were the first fruits of the Spirit. We, we eagerly await the adoption as sons, okay? So there are two truths that we need to understand here in this fatherhood. We are adopted now spiritually, and then one day physically. The adoption process will be complete with the resurrection. Okay? So our hope is not in heaven. Our hope is not uh, in this earth. Our hope is in the final resurrection. When we will be revealed as the true sons of our heavenly father. He talks about the spirit interceding for us. Um, the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You, you have this idea of, of according to the will of God, uh, according to purpose. God is working, uh, works all things together for our good. So this here is, this is power. This is authority. God is the one determining authority. Okay. So you have this, in, in lordship and father, you have the same, the same uh, things that are happening, okay? What I'm trying to help us to see is that uh, lordship and, and, and God as father are, are two different yet heavily overlapping ideas of who God is, okay? Um, and then he, we have even just more, just, just this... This continued idea of sonship, I, I don't want to belabor this as brothers. Um, and then, of course, we have this idea of, of um, the more, uh, this is the power of God, right? He is doing this. He is bringing us to glorification. Um, and we also have authority here. And then this is leading to our literal presence with God. Biba, this is leading to our literal presence with God. Okay. And then here we again have this idea of um, this here, Manga Kapitid, is again a statement of his fatherly love and actions for us. Biba. What father, we give everything to their children. I told Bethany I'll be a strong, I will not give in. When my daughter Carmichael asks, it is so hard for me to, I, I have to give it to her. <laughs> my wife always says, you are such a softie. But think about that. How much more God, if he gave us his son, how much more will he graciously give us all things? This is who God is, a generous, loving, caring father. A generous, loving, caring father. And then there's this call about who will uh, separate us from the elect. We, we discussed that. Well, what can separate us? And then the conclusion is, is no, nothing can separate us. And coming down here, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
Okay, so this is this is uh, father. And you see that love. You see this love here. You see this love. You see uh, uh, union with Christ, right? And we see this lordship. <laughs> lordship, right? And here we also see, we also see authority power and presence. Nothing can separate us. That's, that's, that's power, right? How can this be? How, how, how can, so, so the power is nothing can separate us. How, how, how can Paul make this statement unless God has the authority to ordain it? Diba? So there's, a, there's authority in the ordaining. Nothing can separate us. There's power in the actual act of preventing anything from separating us, right? You have these, these, uh, these angels. You have these rulers, these things present, things to come. These, these are all things trying to separate us. So the authority is nothing will separate us. The power actually brings that into reality. And then, of course, the fruit is the continued presence of God. <laughs> so, so we see this here, okay? Um, and then we also see lordship. Lordship is conveyed in, in Father, in this idea of Father. But really, we also see that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And so there's just all of these things, what I'm trying to get at, they're interwoven. They're interwoven. And this is, this, these are the fundamental truths of who God is um, uh, from chapter 3. God is Lord, and God is our father. Okay. There's another passage. We don't have time to go there. What I'll do is I'll post some things and you can explore. Um, uh, the other passage I had wanted to go to, but I figured we would not have time is Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about how God disciplines us as sons. And so we need to balance the, our view of the love of God with the fact that he can discipline us if we are wayward children, okay? Um, we need to balance the fatherhood with the lordship, that even though he's our father, it's not a father that's incompetent, that just gives us everything we want. There is still this accountability. We still need to follow his will, okay? So let's, let's quickly, it's becoming late here. Um, I appreciate your, uh, your patience. Let's just close. I, I just want to highlight some of these things, and then I'll post this content on the, on the page. Um, the things that I want to highlight here are, um, we are in union with his son, Jesus Christ, divine presence, both in heaven and here. Uh, next, uh, those whom the spirit leads are sons of God. So there's divine presence. There's also divine authority that we're, we're following. There's lordship. And there's this fatherhood idea here as well. Uh, and then there's uh, this, this uh, we are not in slavery anymore. We're not in fear anymore. We are now adopted sons and daughters. We need to view ourselves as sons and daughters. Um, sometimes we view God as it's a works-based where we are just, it's like I make one mistake and I'm out. <laughs> I, I have to atone to become a son again. I have to atone. I have to atone for my sins to become a daughter again. We're living like orphans. We're living as if an orphan doesn't have parents. And so they're always trying to earn status. They're always trying to earn favor with people in the world because they don't have parents. They don't have that unconditional love. And we need to understand that we have unconditional love in relationship with God and our Heavenly Father. That allows us to make mistakes. That allows us to be honest when we, when we sin. That allows us the freedom of, of serving God without this fear of, I make one mistake, you're done. You know, there's going to be a blow up. So we are not in this bondage of slavery anymore. Okay. Um, uh, our relationship with God is very close and intimate. Um, very close and intimate. 
we are sons of God, co-heirs with Christ. And so um, think about that. We are, we are co-heirs with Christ as sons. Think about that. So powerful. Uh, and, then, then, and then moving along here, lastly, we have God as our Father recreates us. So we are a new creation. Anyone who is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. We are created in Christ Jesus beforehand so that we can do good works. Okay, so we are, we are new creations now spiritually and one day physically. This denotes divine power, okay? God as our Heavenly Father is in control and uses his authority to bring us to completion. And so God is both ordaining authority and then actually powerful, bringing that into reality, what he ordains. And verse, uh, verses 31 to 36, God the Father reveals his perfect love for us in sending his son. So I was talking to someone and they were saying, like, how could God send, someone, send people to hell? You know, how is that a loving God? Um, but if God doesn't, but, but the purpose of, of creation, the purpose of the world is not man-centered, but God-centered, okay? We will never see God's love for us until we see our own condition. And we'll never see our own condition unless you have the the contrast. So black on white is a contrast. And so um, God permitted, ordained this world to happen so that he could reveal to us his perfect love in sending his son. No one will send their sons for enemies. I know that I've recently been struggling. How in the world do you send your son? How do you die for someone who, who's your enemy? That's so hard. Diva, it's, it's so hard. To, to think about, but God, while we were yet enemies, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then lastly, God as our heavenly father has perfect love for us. And because of his power and control, nothing will separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. And so I want us to think about this. God's lordship is absolutely fundamental for our assurance of salvation. So this is connecting last week with this week. God has to be authoritative, all-powerful, and present if his promises are going to be realized. And just like the pro we discussed, um, the promise of Abraham is for us. Maybe that's for another study one day. But those promises to Abraham, to Jacob, to Isaac are for us. Um, and so God's lordship is absolutely foundational for the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of, that is in Christ, okay? So, you know, people say, I don't like talking about lordship. Let's just talk about God as father. If he's not lord, he's not father, okay? The lordship, the lordship is eternal the Lordship is what allows all the promises to be realized. It's what causes him to make the promises, his authority, his power, and his presence. Okay? I want to say this. There is so much more to who God is. You, we could have a whole class just on theology proper, the study of God. Right now in Christianity, Christianity 101, we're just going to the most fundamental, the most fundamental ideas. And so, You'll have a lot more accompanying this in, in, in chapter three. For me, the two most important things in your Christian life that you need to understand today, tonight, now, God is Lord and God is Father. Um, uh, we submit to him as Lord and we communicate, we pray to him in relationship as a father. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll review the assignment. We can talk shop if we want, but I want, to, I want to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we want to lift up your name. We want to exalt your name 
in the name of your Son. We ask for your kingdom to come, and we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father God, we ask for our daily needs. Give us our, our, th those needs that we need. Provide for us every day. And please do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one who, who runs around like a roaring lion. Father God, I pray that you would deliver us and bring us safely into your heavenly kingdom. Father God, yours is the glory, the power, the honor forever and ever. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And lastly, we ask for forgiveness of our sins. Amen.